Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We are very glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we are returning to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we are back to our study of the book of Numbers. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 10. We'll be in Numbers chapter 10 in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you happen to have something that we need to be praying about publicly as a congregation, if there's something that I could be praying for you personally, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we want to take a look at Numbers chapters 10, 11, and 12. And if you've been with us for the past several weeks, you may know that Numbers is a book of numbers. In this book, we have a record of the census that was taken at the beginning of their time in the wilderness, and then we have another census taken at the end of their time in the wilderness before they cross over into the promised land. And the total is just over 600,000 fighting men, leading us to assume a grand total of perhaps two to three million people when we include the women and the children. And in between the first census and the last one, we have a few updates along the way, and we have a record of some of those things that happened as they were traveling in the wilderness. Well, the book of Numbers also explains why the people didn't go straight from Egypt to the promised land and why that trip took 40 years instead of just a few weeks. And we'll really get into the reasoning behind that in our study next Wednesday, if the Lord wills. But it was ultimately due to their lack of faith and their rebellion, their lack of trust in the Lord. And Paul certainly uses this to warn us not to rebel like they did in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So tonight, they finally get to leave Mount Sinai. So in the big scheme of things, they are leaving Mount Sinai. So let's jump into it tonight with Numbers chapter 10. If you're leading two to three million people in the wilderness, and you need to get them up and moving from point A to point B, what, what is one thing that you would need? I mean, I know there's a lot of things we would need on a, a journey or a challenge like that, but among other things, I'm thinking you would need a way to get their attention. Hey, it is time to move. You people need to get going. And as camp director, I would sometimes use a whistle or maybe a bell. It wasn't like I was a teacher where I had kind of a relationship built over a semester with some students, uh, but you kind of had to get their attention in a hurry, and I think that's kind of the way it was with Moses. So that's what we see here. So let's take a look at Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camps set out. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown for them to set out. When convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. The priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feast and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So just again, before they set out for the first time, God has Moses make these two silver trumpets, and they are to sound these trumpets as a sign. Uh, only one calls out for the leaders, both together in various combinations will get the whole camp moving or alerted to danger. They would use these as alarms in case they are about to be attacked or need to head out to battle and so on. So this is what they get done here right before they head out. Before we move on from this, I want to share an image of the Arch of Titus. This is in the ruins in ancient Rome, uh, basically downtown Rome in the ancient world, we might say. We saw this when we visited Rome many years ago, and this was one of the highlights of that trip. Basically, when the emperor sent Titus to go over to, to destroy the city of Jerusalem after a rebellion, uh, Titus got the job done in this uh, 
a pretty overwhelming way. And when he got back, they built him this arch in order to commemorate this great event. Uh, on the inside of the arch, you can see the Roman soldiers. They are there looting the temple. They are carrying out the table of showbread. You can barely make that out. Uh, you can notice in kind of the middle towards the left, you can see they're carrying out the, the lampstand. And then you can also see in the red oval that they are carrying out the two silver trumpets. And we actually have some uh, reproductions of these trumpets on the left side up here. And then I've zoomed in even further on the trumpets on the Arch of Titus on the right. But it's just interesting to me that we have archaeological evidence for the trumpets. And tonight we are studying the passage where God told them to make those trumpets back around 1400 BC. So that's kind of a neat thing to be able to see. Hope you appreciate that. I do. I, I appreciate seeing this. Um, let's continue with the next paragraph. The people actually move out for the first time. So Numbers 10, 11 through 20. Numbers 10, 11 through 20. Now in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th of the month, the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony. And the sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So they moved out for the first time according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses. The standard of the camp of the sons of Judah, according to their army, set out first, with Nashon the son of Amminadab over its army, and Nathaniel the son of Zoar over the tribal army of the sons of Issachar, and Eliab the sons of, uh, son of Helon over the tribal army of the sons of Zebulun. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who were carrying the tabernacle, set out. Uh, next, the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their army, set out with Elizer, the son of Shedder, over its army, and uh, so on. I don't think we need to read every single uh, word up here, but we're just now... Uh, just over one year away from when they first left Egypt, two months into their second year. And notice the cloud lifts up over the tabernacle, so that indicates that it is time to go. And they follow it from the wilderness of Sinai to the wilderness of Paran. And this paragraph and the next one kind of give us the details of that. So Judah goes first under his banner or flag, and the rest of the tribes follow along after that one. In verse 17, the tabernacle is then taken down. Everybody has a job to do, and the people continue moving out tribe by tribe. Uh, we continue with the next paragraph. The people continue moving out, Numbers 10, 21 through 27. Then the Kohathites set out carrying the holy objects, and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. Uh, next, the standard of the camp of the sons of Ephraim, and so on. And let's skip down to verse 25. Then the standard of the camp of the sons of Dan, according to their armies, which form the rear guard, uh, for all the camps set out, with Ahizer, the son of Amishadai, over its army, and Pegiel, the son of Akran, over the tribal army of the sons of Asher, and Ahira, the son of Enan, over the tribal army of the sons of Naphtali. This was the order of march of the sons of Israel by their armies as they set out. So we just continue seeing the various uh, items of the tabernacle being carried by different families. And the tabernacle gets set up before everybody gets there, and then they camp out around it as they had been instructed to do previously. Well, this next section is not really in chronological order, I don't think, but it explains something about Moses' in-laws and how they ended up with the Israelites on this journey through the wilderness. So this is Numbers 10. Let's look at verses 29 through 36. Numbers 10, 29 through 36. Then Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are setting out to the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will do you good, for the Lord has promised good concerning Israel. But he said to him, I will not come, but rather will go to my own land and relatives. Then he said, Please do not leave us, inasmuch as you know where we should camp in the wilderness and you will be as eyes for us. So it will be if you go with us that whatever good the Lord does for us, we will do for you. Thus they, they, thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days journey with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Then it came about when the ark set out that Moses said, rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. When it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriad thousands of Israel. 
So apparently then some of Moses' in-laws are with them in the wilderness. And notice in that first opening paragraph there, there is some back and forth here. Moses invites his extended family to come along with them to the promised land. Uh, they very politely decline. Moses insists, uh, asking them to come along as scouts. So you're not just going to be baggage. You're not going to be a burden on us. We need you out there. You know the area. And it appears that they agree to what Moses has suggested here. So everybody leaves when the Ark of the Covenant sets out. Moses, as I see it here, breaks out in praise. In the New American Standard, at least, it's set apart in poetry form. There is some verse to it. And so we can probably safely assume that maybe there is some rhyme and rhythm, maybe kind of a song of some kind. Uh, basically, Moses' way of asking for God's blessing as they travel and as they settle back down. So the people are now on their way. They've left Mount Sinai. They've traveled. They've set up camp for a little bit further along in the wilderness. Unfortunately, as sometimes happens on long road trips, people started whining. I don't know if that ever happens to you on long road trips, but let's look at Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. We'll get into this. Numbers 11, 1 through 9. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish, which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance was like that of delium. The people would go about and gather it and grind it between two millstones or beat it in the mortar and boil it in the pot and make cakes with it. And its taste was as the taste of cakes of, of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Well, as I've said many times through the years, as far as I can tell from scripture, God has killed more people for the sin of whining than for any other sin. And this is part of it right here. They whine and complain. God gets mad. His anger burns against the people. God actually consumes some of them with fire right there on the outskirts of the camp. I don't know if all of you have seen it. I hope you have. Right above the bulletin in our church entryway, there's that little wall hanging that says, Thou shalt not whine. I kind of think about that as the 11th commandment. Not literally, but um, don't add to the Bible. But that seems to be a big thing back then. The people whine, and God really got mad about that. So I think that came through the giveaway uh, one of the early years that we did that. And one of us kind of snagged it, and we hung it up there, and that's kind of been uh, our reminder as we come in the front door of church. Thou shalt not whine. Um, well, we kind of think that might be the end of it here. God consumes some people, and maybe it dies down a little bit, and it goes away, but it's not gone. Uh, notice in verse 4, those who are greedy continue to whine. So there's a motivation behind this. They want more than they have. They, they want some meat to eat. And at this point, notice they start longing for Egypt. And they start talking and reminiscing about how good they had it back then. Man, we had free fish. Was the fish really free? When you're a slave, is, is the fish that you eat free? And they go on and on about the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But what one little detail about their time in Egypt are they forgetting? They're slaves. They were slaves, weren't they? They were being beaten. They were being abused. They were crying out to God for help. And it's amazing how this spirit of whining can take over in a group of people. And suddenly, people are talking with one another, and that whining grows like a cancer. And then people come to the leadership, and people are talking about things, and, and it just has a way of growing. And we may focus then, at that point, on only what we do not have, and, uh, and not how bad things could be. And they really aren't bad at all at this point. God was feeding them manna in the wilderness. And so we have this reminder. Reminder: Manna was this uh, uh, substance that would appear along with the dew overnight. They would grind it up. I kind of think about maybe grits, um, how they're kind of multifunctional. <laughs> you can eat it with a lot of stuff, kind of neutral, and then you can do different things with it. So they would collect it. They would cook with it. 
uh, but they're bored with the mana. And they're not too far into this. They're like just over a year in. And uh, they are, they're absolutely uh, just losing it over this. And uh, they, they really almost want to go back to Egypt at this point for the good food. Well, at this point, Moses chimes in. This is Numbers 11, verses 10 through 15. Numbers 11, 10 through 15. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid the burden of all this people on me? Was it I who conceived all this people? Was it I who brought them forth, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing infant to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I going to get meat to give to all this people for they weep before me saying give us meat that we may eat i alone am not able to carry all this people because it is too burdensome for me so if you are going to deal thus with me please kill me at once if i have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness well i would just point out here that sometimes whining is especially discouraging to the leadership of a congregation so again things may be going fairly well in the big picture but then that whining sets in and and you know in this condition in this case Moses he's had enough and notice he reminds God I didn't ask for this I didn't want to be here in the first place why are you doing this to me so notice how the whining has now spread hasn't it Moses is now whining to God about the whining it's kind of how whining goes and now Moses is worried about the meat. Now, where am I going to get enough meat to feed two to three million people in the wilderness? This is beyond me. I, I just can't do this anymore. In fact, God, why don't you just go ahead and kill me right now? That's how bad this is. That's how discouraging this is to Moses as the leader of the people. So let's pick up with Numbers 11, 16 through 30. I know it's a larger paragraph, but uh, I think we'll move, move through it very quickly. Numbers 11, 16 through 30. The Lord therefore said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the Spirit who is upon you, and I will put him upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you will not bear it all alone. Say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for we were well off in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat so that they may eat for a whole month? Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? The Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Also he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took of the Spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the seventy elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those who had been registered, but had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. Well, we're not going to go through this verse by verse, but God pretty much handles the Moses part of this problem by getting Moses some help. 
He appoints 70 elders to bear some of the burden of leadership. Maybe Moses had forgotten the lesson that he would learned earlier from his father-in-law Jethro. Or maybe he just needs some more men. But there's there's a value to having a group to lean on instead of one man trying to do all of this alone. Well then, once he has Moses squared away, God then reveals his plan for dealing with the whining among the people. And if I could paraphrase this, God is saying, you want meat? I'll give you meat. And you'll eat it for a month, so much that it'll come out of your nose as you eat it. And Moses doesn't understand. He doesn't have access to that kind of meat. So he's confused. Are we going to fish every fish in the ocean? Are we going to harvest every creeping thing or all around the land? And so God reminds Moses who he's dealing with. And to do this, God pours out his spirit on these elders and they prophesy. And then we've got this kind of side note down at the end concerning two men who missed the meeting. Have you ever had people miss a meeting that they're supposed to be in and they're not there and they got to get caught up? Well, God kind of handled that for them. <laughs> and they're off there prophesying on their own. And uh, so somebody's concerned that, you know, um, they shouldn't be doing that and and. Basically, it's all going to be okay. So it just further proves that God is completely behind this. So let's pick up with Numbers 11, 31 through 35, the next section here. Numbers 11, 31 through 35. Now there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubits deep on the surface of the ground. The people spent all day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers. Then they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. When the meat was still between their teeth before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. So the name of that place was called Kibroth Hadavah because there they buried the people who had been greedy. From Kibroth Hadavah, the people set out for Hazaroth, and they remained at Hazaroth. So notice here, God takes care of the problem, just as he said he would. He uses a wind to bring up quail from the sea, and they fall on the camp. And the quail end up being two cubits deep. So if a cubit is from the tip of the fingers to the elbows, 18 inches, so three feet deep in all directions for a day's journey. The entire land was miraculously covered in dead birds so much so that they are buried in dead birds and a plague spreads through the camp. I think about getting three feet of snow. It, it's happened here and there. And it's just so overwhelming to deal with. But imagine that being dead birds. Some of you may like dead birds instead of snow. I don't know. But again, God has killed more people for whining than for just about any other sin. I think that's a good reminder for us today. All right, so the survivors break camp and they move on to a new location. That brings us to another big problem. This is over in Numbers 12. We're moving into our last chapter tonight, Numbers 12, 1 through 8. Numbers 12, 1 through 8. Notice the next struggle we're going to face here. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? You know, personally, I might have expected more trouble from the people. But this issue comes from the top, doesn't it? This comes from within the leadership team, we might say. So Miriam and Aaron, they should have known better. But they're upset with their brother Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. And we're not told why they're mad about this other than that she is from Cush, which is very roughly Sudan or Ethiopia today. And they start with that. That's kind of the, the pretense 
But the problem may not really be the problem, because notice it seems that they are using this as an excuse to bring up another issue. They really seem to be a bit jealous here, don't they? If I could paraphrase, they are saying to their brother, who do you think you are? Who put you in charge over us? So they're a little bit jealous of his leadership position, it seems. And it's ironic because did Moses go looking for this position? This is not something he campaigned for. I remember years and years ago, my dad telling me, if a man is out there campaigning for the office of elder, that's the guy you don't want being an elder. <laughs> I thought that was good advice. And that was Moses. He was not looking for this leadership position. In fact, Moses did everything in his power to get out of being God's spokesman in this. So Moses was happy out there with the sheep in the middle of nowhere, but God appeared to him in the burning bush, and Moses wanted nothing to do with going to Pharaoh and leading millions of people to freedom. That was not his plan for the rest of his life. This, he's 80 years old. Well, nevertheless, God calls Moses and Aaron and Miriam to the tent of meeting. God appears in the pillar of cloud. God makes this abundantly clear. Sometimes I speak to people in visions. Sometimes I, I talk to prophets in dreams, but not so with Moses. I don't mumble when I talk to Moses, we might say. I speak to Moses face to face. I think that's how I would paraphrase that openly. I'm clear with Moses. You know, I'm not telling him parables and, and kind of foggy visions of the future. No, he speaks clearly to Moses. And God very clearly implies that Aaron and Miriam should have been afraid to even bring this up. And so they dared to walk where they should not have been walking. So let's close tonight with Numbers 12, 9 through 16. Let's see the, the resolution to this issue. Numbers 12, 9 through 16. So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, I beg you, do not account this sin to us, in which we have acted foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one dead, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, O oh God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. So God then handles the rebellion and the complaining of Aaron and Miriam by striking Miriam with leprosy. Why not Aaron? Why doesn't Aaron get leprosy? Or why don't they both get leprosy? And I don't know. Maybe Miriam was the ringleader. Maybe she was the instigator on this one. Maybe she pulled Aaron aside and said, hey, we got to talk to Moses because this, this, and this. We don't know why. But for whatever reason, when the cloud lifts from over the tent, Miriam is covered in leprosy. And it's like the worst case of leprosy anybody's ever seen. And this now causes Aaron to beg forgiveness from his brother. And that's interesting. Just a few moments earlier, they are mad at Moses for being the only one God is speaking through. As if Moses even had anything to do with that. But now Aaron is begging Moses to intercede on his behalf. So Aaron is now begging his brother to do the very thing that he was just mad about. It's interesting how the tables have completely turned, and he's completely desperate. And so he goes to his brother. Imagine begging your brother for something like that. And Moses receives that well. He doesn't hold the grudge. He cries out to God. God listens, but Miriam is healed, although she holds the whole camp up for the next seven days as she goes through either the, the healing process or maybe the ritual purification. Uh, but at the end of the chapter, the people move yet again. All right, so an interesting chapter I think we've had tonight. Uh, three chapters here. This brings us to the end of the first 12 chapters now of the book of Numbers. Uh, next week, let's pick up with Numbers 13. We'll come to the account of the spies being sent out to scope out the promised land. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something that we need to be praying about, if there's some question we can help answer, if there's something we can do to encourage you, uh, let me know. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. 
or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only amazing and awesome God. We know that you bless us in every way. And we ask tonight, Father, that you forgive us when we forget that. Forgive us when we complain, because we sometimes do. We pray for a deeper understanding of who you are and what you've done for us. And we pray, Father, that we would always be thankful. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. We love you and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.